Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I think I know almost everyone here, but for those who don't know me, my name is Tom Miles. I'm from the Law School. And it's a particular privilege to welcome you today for our 2023 Fulton Lecture in Legal History. Uh, Maurice and Muriel Fulton, the lectureship in legal history was created in 1985 through a generous gift from uh, the Fultons. Maurice Fulton uh, was a graduate both of the college and a member of the law school class of 1942. And his wife, Muriel, was uh, an alumna of the college and we're thrilled with her. Uh, daughter Barbara is here today uh, and has brought like a spectacular photo of her parents uh, looking very smart on campus uh, when they were students here. So please welcome. It's delightful. wonderful to have you back at the law school for this special event. Uh, since the University of Chicago Law School was founded, uh, we have advanced and celebrated interdisciplinary scholarship in law. And indeed, uh, in our very first year of operation, uh, the law school encouraged students who were coming to the law school, in particular who had graduated from the college or were about to graduate from the college, to take courses in legal history. Because what we said at that time was the special value and interest of history to any future lawyer. And interestingly, the classes that were recommended at that time were really four. Uh, one was Constitutional and Political History of England from the reign uh, of Edward I. And then a second course from the reign of Edward the Fourth, Edward the First to the Revolution of 1688. And then the other pair of courses that were offered were the Constitutional History of the United States up until 1815, and then from 1815 to 1875. And I think that's when history stopped at that point. <laughs> uh, the Fulton Lecture is a very special event that continues our tradition of interdisciplinarity and our celebration of legal history. And through the Fulton Lecture, we bring a prominent legal historian to the law school every year. And in recent years, the Fulton Lecture has explored a wide range of topics. Uh, for example, we recently had a lecture on the impact of propaganda on civil liberties in the First World War. Another Fulton Lecture addressed the impact of Presidents Johnson and Nixon on the contemporary Supreme Court. And so we're delighted to welcome uh, our speaker today and add to this distinguished uh, legacy of the Fulton Lecture. Our lecturer today is Dr. Nicholas Cole. Dr. Cole is a senior research fellow at Pembroke College uh, at Oxford. He also directs the Quill Center, uh, the Quill Project, which is a research center. Uh, Dr. Cole is a historian of American legal history and political thought. He studies the political thought of the 18th and early 19th century and the evolution of institutional structures. He is currently at work on a digital project that considers how constitutions and treaties have been negotiated over the past 200 years. Dr. Cole has a specific interest in the influence of classical political thought on American, America's first politicians and the search for a new science of politics in post-independence America. He's written extensively on the reception of classical antiquity in the modern world, and in particular, his doctoral work focused on the use of Jefferson's generation of classical antiquity. Now, Dr. Cole also works to build tools to help humanists make more accurate and better informed judgments uh, as the volume of writing has grown and grown beyond the capacity of any one individual to master it. So he also serves, as I mentioned, as director of the Quill Project. The Quill Project examines the importance of texts that govern our societies and our daily lives. These are constitutions, treaties, and legislation, and examines how they are negotiated and involved, and involved over time. So today, Dr. Cole uh, is going to discuss America's, writing America's constitutions, the rise and fall of government through reflection and choice. Please join me in welcoming our 2023 Fulton Lecturer, Nicholas Cole. So it's a, it's a great honor to be speaking at the University of Chicago and giving this particular lecture. And I, I'd like to thank the generosity of my hosts, and in particular, Alison LaCroix, uh, for making me so welcome. Uh, as the Dean said, I spent the last six or seven years um, thinking about how to use computers to properly study the work of America's many state constitutional conventions and the evolution of federal tax. 
Um, the University of Chicago is featured a little in that broader project already uh, with colleagues at Utah Valley University. I've been collaborating on a project studying the records of the 1969 to 70 state convention in Illinois, a process in which faculty from this law school played a leading role. Um, an occasion like this, though, I thought uh, was an opportunity not to show you uh, lots of, sort of computer visualizations. If you want them, they're online, um, but rather an opportunity to reflect. Uh, and I've used the occasion of this le lecture to think about the public understanding of convention processes and the broader civic and political culture from which they emerged. The title of the paper, of course, is taken from Hamilton's words in Federalist I, and they hold a particular importance for me since they are, insofar as I can accurately reconstruct the motivations of more than 20 years ago, the words that first inspired me to think about the system of government in America as something worthy of study. Uh, Hamilton wrote, it has frequently uh, been remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide that important question whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. Hamilton was writing in October 1787 to urge the ratification of the proposed US Constitution to the people of New York. A series of essays had already started to appear in the New York press under a variety of classical pseudonyms, criticizing the text that had emerged from the Philadelphia Convention of that summer, which had met in secret and which had outrageously fundamentally overstepped its brief. Rather than recommending proposals for the revision of the governing document of the Confederation, it had instead proposed setting that instrument entirely to one side, replacing a loose Confederation of States united only by a legislative body in which all voices were equal and in which unanimity was almost required, with a proposed system for national government that would not only possess the three branches of government de deemed essential components of fully competent and sovereign authority by 18th century thought, but which would thereby have the capacity to make, enforce, judge its own laws, possessing legal, and it was easy to imagine, military coercive powers against both the several states and their individual citizens. The New York Assembly would not vote to establish a ratifying convention for New York until the 1st of February, 1788. And such was the importance of the moment, and so profound were the issues at hand that the Assembly set aside the usual property qualifications for voting and instead established that all free men over the age of 21 would be able to vote for the ratifying convention's members. Hamilton, along with the other authors of The Federalist, realized that the passage of the proposed federal constitution in New York would not be easy. The arguments, rapidly marshaled by contrary voices in the summer of 1787, drew widely on established principles of political thought and amounted to an assault not only on the particular provisions of the proposed constitution, but to the possibility of a properly Republican form of government in the territory of the United States at all. The pamphlet and newspaper column war, which we now know as the, uh, as the Federalist and Anti-Federalist debates, continued for months. Victory for the Federalist cause was secured in New York only by a margin of three votes, and the form of ratification was accompanied by extensive proposals, not only for a Bill of Rights, but for amendments that would have revisited some of the compromises of the Philadelphia Convention, and that could, for example, have greatly curtailed the ability of the federal government to maintain a standing army or to raise taxes independently of state authority. So what then of Hamilton's phrase, government through reflection and choice? The choice before voters was clear, rather clearer perhaps than the choice before many UK voters one rainy afternoon in 2016. Perhaps the choice was rather clearer than that before many US voters each election cycle as they vote in many states on popular initiatives to amend state constitutions. But the reflection to which Hamilton refers connoted, I think, rather more than the period of public debate. It referred instead to the process by which the Constitution had been drafted and indeed looked ahead to the process by which resolutions would be drafted in New York State's ratifying convention itself. 
When we think of the operation of democracy in the contemporary moment, we emphasize now, rightly, of course, the universal franchise, free and fair elections, and um, such matters. But in the 18th century, the other half of that equation was the ability of groups of people to meaningfully author texts collectively. The 1787 Constitution of the United States was but one of countless documents drafted by official and unofficial assemblies in America's 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. The culture of collective authorship shaped, in turn, the operations of countless political meetings, civic institutions, private clubs, and societies across this period. Whether the echoes of this once widely shared culture can survive the 21st century remains to be seen. We forget that now, I think, that there were a few truly fundamental texts of the revolution that had a single author. The Declaration of Independence, even if largely written by Thomas Jefferson, was revised first by the other four members of the drafting committee, which Congress had assigned the task, and then by Congress itself. If the 1774 address to the King and later Olive Branch petition had similarly been written by drafting committees, state constitutions written after independence were adopted by convention processes or by drafting processes within legislative assemblies. At the center of the story for this afternoon, however, must be the work of the Philadelphia Convention itself, even though that story will be familiar to everyone present. I would nevertheless like to revisit the work of the Convention, focusing not only on the particular compromises, sorry, focusing not on the particular compromises made by the delegates, but rather by the process that allowed a text to be produced at all. We are perhaps now so over-familiar with the merits and deficiencies of the eventual compromises that we often fail to notice that the process of debate had achieved the apparently impossible. A text neither fully national nor fully confederal in its design, a text that, that did not resolve the questions of sovereignty fully in favor of the states or the national government, but which instead divided power in ways that almost all theorists before the summer of 1787 and many subsequently had declared and would declare to be impossible. No delegate and certainly no state delegation arrived at the convention with anything like the federal structure that would ultimately emerge clearly in their mind. Had the two sides simply dug into their respective positions, compromise would have been impossible. This then is the story of the mechanics behind this seemingly impossible compromise and many subsequent uh, ones, and how parliamentary procedure has facilitated co constitution making ever since. And just as, as Farrah Peterson has recently asserted, we should remember the importance of private law when understanding how many members of the founding generation understood constitutional texts. So too, we should remember the central role that parliamentary law played in their understanding of how groups might meaningfully act collectively with reason, purpose, and respect for contrary voices. Since parliamentary law is not adjudicated by courts, I suspect it is now neglected by most, if not all, law schools, but it was once a core part of the liberal arts curriculum. It is perhaps tempting to think that the ability for assemblies to meaningfully draft text collectively is a wholly modern invention. And it is true that the processes with which this essay um, engages depend principally for their operation on literacy, on pens and papers, on secretaries, on copyists, and on printers. Surely the assemblies of the ancient world, largely illiterate and of seemingly unmanageable size, would have been incapable of anything akin to the modern process of proposal and amendment and of debate of text. But there are tantalizing hints that even thousands of years ago, this was not in fact the case. It appears to have been the case that speeches in the Roman Senate could materially affect pub the text of published decrees, though the procedure by which this happened was obscure. Plutarch's Lycurgus suggests in chapter six, and I'm grateful for my, to my colleague, Yogi Cantor at Oxford for reminding me of this passage and its significance. Um, but it, it appears in Lycurgus uh, that the ancient popular assembly of Sparta, of Sparta might have had at least at one stage quite extensive powers of amendment, uh, because there was this complaint, which might seem familiar. Uh, when the multitude was thus assembled, no one of them was permitted to make a motion 
but the motion was laid before them by senators and kings to be accepted or rejected by the people because there had been many occasions when additions and subtractions had perverted the sense of the motions laid before them, and so they were forbidden from making changes. Whatever the ancient history, however, of collective text making, modern processes were most strongly associated with the traditions of the British Parliament, codified in 1689 by George Pettit in his Lex Parliamentaria, which he almost immediately revised into a much expanded edition. Copies of the many London printings certainly made their way to America, and from at least 1716, the work was also printed in America itself. A note in Benjamin Franklin's receipt, receipt book notes that he lent out his copy to the merchant Hugh Roberts in 1752. As America was fighting for its independence, a more modern work by John Hatzell, president of the Proceedings of the House of Commons, was published in 1781, and was subsequently much quoted by Thomas Jefferson in his manual for the United States Senate in 1803, which became one of the most convenient authorities for American readers and much republished with various changes by subsequent editors. The 19th century saw a flurry of such publications, at once descriptive, but also claiming to be authoritative. Uh, the American Luther Cushing's rule, uh, Cushing, sorry, Rules of Proceeding and Debate in American Deliberative Assemblies in 1845 and his later volume, Lex Parliamentaria Americana, were two of the mo most august. On both sides of the Atlantic, though, a series of publications under such titles as Rules of Order, Robert's Rules of Order uh, became the most famous brand name, I think, uh, but one of only a series of commercial publications, How to Conduct Meetings, The Right Way to Conduct Meetings, the ABC of Chairmanship, published until the 1980s by the Fabian Society for the Labour Party, attempted to adapt the rules that the British Parliament had over centuries adopted to its, for itself for, for a variety of use in a variety of other settings, be they formal legislative bodies, party political management, or the boardroom. Erskine Mays, a treatise on the law, privileges, proceedings, and usage of Parliament, proceeding, preceded Cushing's manual by only a year, and this has tended to and, and this has tended to be read principally as a manual for Parliament itself, but most, if not all, of these other works tended to emphasize their utility for non-legislative settings. One reviser of the American manuals in 1901 amended the title to make its applicability to business meetings explicit, calling it Cushing's Manual of Parliamentary Practice with Rules of Procedure in Business Corporations. And alongside texts of this type, there were a number of manuals written explicitly for school use, either for pupils when running their own societies or for the use of teachers explaining the process of legislative debate to their pupils over a series of lessons. It is no coincidence at all that some of the works published in the 1920s were written explicitly for use in girls' schools, the 19th Amendment having been ratified in 1920. But it is important to emphasize that while legislative assemblies were one important forum, where this knowledge might prove useful, all of the American authorities emphasized that an understanding of the tradition of rules for formal debate was essential for participation in meetings of all types, and it was a skill that had to be taught and studied in its own right. In American texts, there was a theoretical disagreement as to where the ultimate source of authority lay on questions of parliamentary law. Some manuals, including the Lex Parliamentaria, showed considerable continued deference to British parliamentary practice. And indeed, there is far more discussion in the Lex Parliamentaria Americana of changes in British practice in the 19th century than there is a detailed discussion of American state assemblies or even Congress. Robert, on the other hand, preferred a more American and patriotic approach, saying that where a body had not adopted specific rules on a question Quote, upon all great parliamentary questions, such as what motions can be made, what is their order of precedence, which can be debated, what is their effect, etc., that the common law of the land is settled by the practice of the U.S. House of Representatives and not by that of the English Parliament, the U.S. Senate, or any other body. As he further noticed, uh, noted, however, discerning the fine points of detail in the practice of the U.S. House of Representatives could be extremely difficult. And here it is perhaps 
important to note two features of all of the codifications of parliamentary practice. In the first place, an appeal to ancient practice was important to, uh, and by ancient I mean sort of medieval uh, British practice, um, but understood as sort of um, time immemorial. Um, uh, appeal to, to ancient practice was important for all of these manuals, but they often, and, and so important was that, that they often distorted the rules that they recommended. Most of the authors, including the author of the Lex Parliamentaria itself, found it easier to document the practice of the, the parliaments of previous centuries than contemporary practice. Their authors seem to delight in strange, archaic, and even contradictory rules, all of which were seen to add to the mystery of the process of deliberative debate. Jefferson quoted uh, Hastel and was in turn quoted by many other writers uh, when he wrote, and whether these forms and rules be in all cases most rational or not is not really of so great importance. It is much more material that there should be a rule to go by than what the rule is, that there should be a uniformity of proceeding in the business not subject to the caprice of the speaker or the capriciousness of the members of an assembly. Secondly, these works were all to an extent and especially those seeking to, not to codify the law for a particular body, but rather to use the general form of parliamentary law to propose basic rules for, for more general bodies, they were all seeking to chart a tradition of practice that was by its very nature constantly evolving. But in 1787, such points were largely for the future. On the 14th of May, 1787, Delegates began to arrive for the convention, but the convention wouldn't be called until the 25th. On that day, the convention, in accordance with usual parliamentary practice, immediately elected uh, George Washington to the chair and appointed a secretary and then established a rules committee. I want to spend a little time thinking about the work of the convention from the point of view of its process rather than its substance. How were the texts, how the texts were written or how legal texts are written might or might not be of interest to lawyers of different persuasions, but ought, I think, in any case, to be a proper topic for study in its own right. The records kept by the Secretary Jackson had been a disappointment to generations of historians. A letter he wrote to Washington at the end of the convention uh, on its final day says that he will uh, call round later after burning all the loose of scraps of paper which belonged to the convention, uh, depositing just the journals and other papers which the vote of the convention had said should be delivered to Washington. The journals and papers which he did give to Washington consist of four bound volumes. The first of these is the journal of the convention itself. The second is the journal of the committee of the whole, and then two volumes with records of votes on particular questions. And then finally, the engrossed copy of the Constitution. Separately, Jackson handed over copies of the Virginia Plan, the revised Virginia Plan, and uh, printed texts related to various stages of the convention process. These were all deposited by Washington with the Secretary of State in 1796, but none of these records were published until 1819, when John Quincy Adams held that office. And during the process of editing and publishing them, he took Jackson to task for the state of the journal and in particular for the fact that none of the resolutions from the final day of debate had been entered into the journal itself. Jackson responded defensively to Adams' inquiries and maintained that he had, in fact, kept private notes. In his own, uh, that he'd agreed not to publish at the request of Washington. It's here, I think, that the, the beginning of a rather unhelpful myth uh, can be seen to develop because John Quincy Adams reflected that the, the proceedings of the convention were conducted and closed in a spirit of unanimity and accommodation, honorable to the in individuals and highly beneficial to the public, which glosses over the many very profound disagreements that the convention had had to manage. As I said, Jackson maintained that he had uh, kept more extensive private notes uh, Adams writes, he told me that he had taken extensive minutes of the convention, but at the request of Washington, had promised that they should never be published during his own life, 
which he supposed had been a loss to him of many thousand dollars. Uh, some later readers have believed uh, Jackson, though the notes have never turned up. In my view, this suggestion is not entirely credible. I think Jackson would have been far too busy with his official task to keep these kinds of notes. What was the business of the secretary? It was to maintain the papers of the convention in such a way as to facilitate debate. The nature of Jackson's record has been profoundly misunderstood. The volumes that we have are written in a fair hand with relatively few crossings out or interleavings. They're not quite the formal handwriting of the official Senate journal for the years 1790 to 91, but they may very well be a fair copy of notes kept daily on paper. Some of the loose scraps of paper that Jackson burned at the end of the convention may well have been his more casual daily notes. But what was most certainly included in what he burned was a running draft of the various texts that it would have been his job to maintain during the debates, allowing him and the members of the convention to keep track of how the draft of particular documents changed through amendment over the course of each day. Before the convention could get into any debate of substance, however, it had to agree the rules suggested by the Rules Committee, which it did by voting on each one in turn. In the course of that discussion, they didn't invent a new process for debate. Governing parliamentary law was simply assumed to be in effect. That said, they did modify the existing rules for their own purposes, providing for particular rules of decorum, so members should stand in their places until George Washington had taken his seat, and adding some peculiar and specific adjustments to the usual process. In turn, the rules then that they adopted can be divided into two broad classes. Some rules are simply there to reaffirm the norms of parliamentary debate by limiting members to speak repeatedly on the same questions, for example, and affirm by their presence that the convention would, in fact, operate as if it were a legislative assembly. So a rule such as a member may not speak more often than twice without special leave upon the same question, and not the second time before any other who have been silent shall have been heard if you choose to speak on a subject. That's a very standard kind of rule. Um, the mo uh, a rule such as um, a motion made and seconded shall be repeated and if written as it shall be when any member shall so require, uh, read aloud by the secretary before it shall be debated and may be withdrawn at any time before the vote uh, on which it, uh, uh, upon, upon it shall have been declared. That again is a very standard kind of rule, although one that locks the um, process into being one that is controlled by the members, not by the chair, because before debate can proceed, you must be debating a specific form of words. Alongside these kinds of traditional elements of parliamentary procedure, two highly unusual points do appear in the rules of the convention, however. The first is that members of the convention could call for a final decision on any question to be postponed until the day after debate on that question had concluded. Presumably this was there to prevent any rush decision making. The second was that the convention instructed its rules committee to find a formulation that met the following requirements. That, it, that the House would not be precluded by a vote on any particular question from revising the subject matter of it when they see cause, nor, on the other hand, led too hastily to rescind a decision which was the result of mature discussion. And the Rules Committee did indeed find a formulation, um, which, is, which is quite uh, complicated, uh, but which says that a on a motion to reconsider a matter which has been determined by a majority may be made with leave unanimously given on the same day in which a vote passes, but otherwise not without one day's notice, in which last case, if the House agree to the reconsideration on some future day, it should be assigned for that purpose. This formulation, which allowed the convention to change its mind, represented a significant departure from the norms of formal proceedings, which usually held that once a question had been decided, it could not be revis revisited. There were both practical and theoretical reasons why this was normally the case. Reopening questions not only wastes the time of legislative bodies, but also threatens to upset that delicate fiction that the answer given to a particular question represents the rational will of a deliberative assembly. If the assembly is seen to give one answer on one day and another the next, why should its deliberations and resolves carry any weight at all? 
spite of this rule, however, members of the convention tended to prefer to defer controversial questions rather than vote down propositions, uh, uh, propositions um, and, and thereby have to trigger use of this kind of rule. Deferring consideration of a question uh, could have the effect of voting against it, but without formally placing opposition on record. As soon as the rules had been introduced, uh, Edmund Randolph, the leader of the Virginia delegation, introduced the so-called Virginia Plan for discussion. And although it's sometimes characterized as, as such, it's not a draft constitution. It was instead a set of 15 points that could be given to some future drafting committee that might be tasked with drawing up a draft constitution. The same day, Charles Pinckney introduced his own plan. This to judge from the comments made in the contemporaneous record and from the, the version of it that he furnished to John Quincy Adams in 1819 for publication, looked much more similar to a constitutional text than anything else introduced at this stage. Both were referred to the Committee of the Whole, a body not mentioned in the rules, but which was inherited from the norms of parliamentary law. And the New Jersey plan uh, wasn't introduced at all until the 15th of June. And the Committee of the Whole is a, is a fairly strange process. For the next few weeks, um, the convention would meet and it would read the minutes in the morning and then it would agree that it would follow the rule it had set the night before, that it was going to resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole. And if the rules were being followed, George Washington would then get up out of his chair and everybody would stand and he would take his seat and then Gorham would take the chair and they would debate for the day. And then at the end of the day, they would resolve that they hadn't finished their discussion and they would ask themselves at the plenary session for permission to do the same thing again on the following day. And Washington would then retake the chair and they would um, go through this process of requesting of themselves permission to meet again in the Committee of the Whole the following day. And there's no way of understanding that except uh, for the fact that the Lex Parliamentaria had said that if you were discussing any grave matter or you were framing principles for very serious um, consideration, you should meet in a committee of the whole first to do it, but the committees of the whole, grand committees, didn't have a power to adjourn. And so the convention shows deference to that normal process. In the committee of the whole, the Virginia plan was debated uh, paragraph by paragraph and indeed clause by clause. As each clause was read out, members could propose amendment or vote the whole clause as agreed. And amendments themselves could be amended uh, before they were voted on. Um, it should be no noted that there was no role in any of this for the chair to steer debate. While the norms of parliament in the 17th century had still allowed that um, so, um, some debate might happen and then a question would be framed by the chair, uh, the norms in the 18th century, and certainly the norms that seem to have been followed at the convention, suggest that at any, every single stage of this process, a specific form of words not controlled by the chair was under, discussing, under discussion. Once the Virginia plan had been agreed, or a draft of it had been agreed in the Committee of the Whole, it was referred back to the plenary session. Before the plenary session could resume its work, however, the question of the other plans, which now included the, the New Jersey plan, needed to be resolved. The New Jersey delegation clearly expected that their very different plan of union would now be debated and refined in the same way that the Virginia propositions had been debated. And Charles Pinkney's plan was also waiting to, for debate. At this point, how Alexander Hamilton filibustered. He gave notice that he would be introducing his own plan and spoke for hours. And when the committee of the whole met the next day, it was with a sense of both wariness and weariness. Uh, and it agreed not to discuss any further plans, but just to report only the Virginia plan to the full body. But after debate returned to the plenary session, issues that had been relatively uncontroversial in the committee of the whole now suddenly appeared deeply so. Because now when resolutions were passed, they would be the will not of a subcommittee, but of the convention itself. The convention moved through each of the paragraphs of the revised Virginia plan, but any vote now carried substantially more weight. It was only by referring specific points of contention to smaller groupings, such as the first, second, and third committees on representation, and then only just, that the convention finally arrived at a text that could be passed to the Committee of Detail 
for use as the basis of a draft constitutional text by Wednesday the 25th of July. And confusingly at this point, and I'm slightly at a loss to explain it, um, except through some sort of courtesy, the Committee of Detail at that moment also passed the other plans that had been placed before the convention, despite the fact that these had never been formally amended or debated and contradicted the text that the convention had in fact voted on in many particulars. The Committee of Detail, which is a smaller grouping, completed its work on the 6th of August, passing back a much extended text for the whole, for the whole body to debate again, paragraph by paragraph, amending it to complete a further draft. And again, the Secretary's job here was to copy each clause into a fresh um, draft as each paragraph was amended and debate continued. And smaller committees were then used at this point for particular points of discussion. Well, at the end of this process, a printed text was finally produced. And even at this stage, that text was debated line by line and there was space for changes before a final text was agreed on the 16th of September. What, we, what are we to make of this laborious process? Well, firstly, it was, in a sense, unremarkable. No one at the time or subsequently ever challenged these kinds of mechanisms on the grounds that they had been an illegitimate or inappropriate process for debate. Importantly, the application of parliamentary law and familiar rules allowed the convention to keep a tight rein on the following questions. What was currently under discussion at every single moment in the convention? The answer was usually a very short piece of text, usually only a few words long. When was the appropriate time to intervene on a particular question? This too was dictated by the process because you could see when the paragraph you wished to contest would come up for debate. What had and had not been definitely decided there might be ambiguities about the meaning of text, but the text that had been agreed was itself definite. What alternative proposals had been tabled for discussion and what had been their fate? That again was a definite question with a definite answer. Thirdly, the mechanisms adopted by the convention assure, ensured that every important question would be thoroughly debated at least three and perhaps as many as five or six times. And I think it's also important to note, fourthly, that the momentum of the process was probably important in ensuring that a final compromise was reached and that it generally commanded the support of those at the convention. Fifthly, in a subtle way, understanding the convention as a parliamentary process governed by parliamentary law also explained the nature of some of the records it left behind. Despite John Quincy Adams' disappointment, Jackson his job was not to keep verbatim minutes, but was to keep a record that enabled the convention to be sure about what it had and hadn't agreed. And it also explains perhaps why no significant speeches by individuals survive either, though we do know that Wilson re did read a speech for Franklin, because it was likely that the members of the convention continued to show a deference to the view strongly expressed in British and American sources until the late 19th century that it was improper for a member of the members of the legislature to read out a, the text of a speech in case, you might be, in case they introduced uh, words that had been written by somebody who didn't have any right to speak there. We can put some figures on the work of the convention. Uh, in total, there are somewhere between uh, 1,100 and 1,400 individual uh, decisions about pieces of text that were taken on, on small fragments as well as paragraphs. And I, I've used the term decisions because um, I, you know, that's, that's a sort of larger term than votes. Not everything needs a, needs a vote in order to be recognized a, a decision. Well, what after Philadelphia? How does the work of the convention compare to that of other similar assemblies? In the United States, there have been at least 235 state constitutional conventions with broad freedom to write or rewrite constitutional texts since the 1770s. Other conventions or commissions have proposed significant amendments uh, to state uh, constitutions, although these may not have been adopted. Almost all of these bodies have adopted a comparable process 
of parliamentary style debate. Uh, although it's important to note that their rules over time have become more complicated, the texts that they've drafted have become longer, and their committee structures have become almost dizzying in their complexity. So that much as so there's a key step strand of research that we have ongoing at the, at the moment in the Quell project to try and work out how to represent the committee structures of some of the most complicated conventions. So our current approach doesn't fit uh, easily on any screen. In conventions from the mid 19th century onwards, uh, specifically created standing committees often drafted discrete sections of texts. And these were then variously reviewed either directly by plenary sessions or first by committees of the whole, and then by plenary sessions. Sadly, the records of these conventions have for the most part been misunderstood or neglected. The memorializing journals published sometimes decades after a particular convention are frequently thought to be the only records available. And a list of resolutions passed by plenary sessions, even, if, um, even where speeches are recorded, is of no real use to reconstruct the work of a constitutional convention if the state committee papers are not also preserved and published alongside them. The editors of, of these memorializing publications, for the most part, omitted the work of committee papers, leaving later readers with the incorrect impression that it's not possible to reconstruct the full work of these conventions. But in fact, the reverse is true. States such as Massachusetts, or Wyoming, where hapless secretaries not only failed to preserve key papers, but could not keep pace with the proceedings, are the exception rather than the norm. And in general, um, I've been very impressed by the standard of record keeping at state level. What did it feel like to be part of the federal convention or some other formal body? How was this process of collective text making regarded by those who participated in it? Well, Jefferson's Manual of Parliamentary Practice recommends its rules of procedure as important to protect, he says, the minority of an assembly not because there are rules that enable filibustering, but because the rules of debate themselves were held to preserve the interests of minority voices. Submission to clear rules of procedure, which allowed for repeated debate and revision of critical texts, allowed for rational discourse as an alternative to um, a simple sort of show of power politics. And I, I'm reminded of his words in the second inaugural address, where he says that um, although the will of the majority should govern, the will of the majority must it to be rightful, must be reasonable. George Washington um, had a sense that these kinds of collective processes from official bodies, as well as unofficial bodies, could themselves threaten the union. And when you understand that this kind of collective action was held to have a kind of legitimacy, I think it helps to make sense of some of his complaints about Thomas Jefferson, who had organized the Democratic Republican Societies. And I do love this letter that he wrote, which picks up many of the themes I've been discussing. The Democratic Republican Societies, of course, are simple political parties. But he condemned Jefferson for helping to set them up. Um, I did not doubt, he said, that this conduct would lead to disaster in time if it did not meet with the frowns of those who were well disposed to order and good government. For, for can anything be more absurd, more arrogant or more pernicious to the peace of society than for self-created bodies forming themselves into permanent senses and under the shade of night in a conclave, resolving that acts of Congress that have undergone the most solemn and deliberate discussion by the representatives of the people chosen for that express purpose and bringing with them from the parts of the different parts of the union their sense of their constituents, endeavoring as far as the nature of the thing will admit to form their will into laws for the government of the whole. I say under these circumstances for a self-created permanent body, no one denies the right of the people to meet occasionally to petition for or remonstrate against any act of the legislature to declare that this act is unconstitutional and that act is pregnant of mischief and that all who vote contrary to their dogmas are activated by selfish motives or under foreign influence, nay, are pronounced traitors to their country, is such a strength of arrogant presumption as not to be reconciled with laudable motives. I, I love that uh, sentence because he's very, very cross and uh, he loses control of the sentence. Um, 
But Washington himself could hardly object to the idea that private societies might meet and might conduct orderly meetings through the passage of resolutions. It was exactly the way that the Society of Cincinnati, uh, of which he was president, organized their business, along with many other bodies. An important resource now for uh, 19th century America uh, that shows how other groups use this kind of process uh, is the Colored Convention Pro Conventions Project, which preserves the records of meetings held between the 1830s and 1890s to advocate for the rights of people of color generally or for the needs of particular groups. These bodies, too, explicitly adopted the form common to many public and private bodies the passage of texts agreed to by groups of people, sometimes with amendment and sometimes without, but certainly with the opportunity to amend and adopt resolutions. Much more than petition alone, these resolutions carried greater moral authority. They were the product of more than one mind, refined through collective consultation. And the Seneca Falls uh, Convention, I think, falls also into this category. And more prosaically, groups in favor of Western emigration would publish resolutions passed at a public meeting, such as those published by the American Society for Encour en Encouraging the Settlement of Oregon in uh, 1829 and similar groups. In fact, a foregone uh, it was almost a foregone conclusion that the idea that a public meeting had been held and that resolutions had been passed gave the ideas expressed a greater force than had a text merely been published as a pamphlet or as a column in a newspaper by a single author. And immigrants themselves agreed to rules to govern their journeys, often making a point of doing so when they passed beyond the territorial boundaries of the state. And we should therefore situate the 1787 Constitutional Convention within a much broader culture of texts meaningfully written by groups of people. This is the civic tradition that produced American democracy. So why do I say the rise and fall of government through reflection and choice? Well, modern legislative assemblies seem dysfunctional, don't they? We don't think well of, pub of parliamentary procedure today. It looks messy, archaic, uh, and as I say, dysfunctional. Uh, the filibuster at federal level uh, has brought the Senate into disrepute. But the real origins are um, perhaps not the filibuster itself, but uh, relaxing rules in the Senate so that bills could move around each other in a way that older authorities would have absolutely abhorred. We've seen the rise of an executive culture. Uh, if, you, if you go over to the School of Management, I don't know if Chicago has a School of Management, but if you do and you read the textbooks there, you won't find any of this tradition in modern manuals about how to run a meeting. Meetings are considered by our colleagues in the business school as opportunities for executives to explain policy and to build teamwork, culture, and that kind of thing. That's the sort of thing that is written about. Um, the passing of resolutions, um, if it is mentioned at all, and in many manuals it isn't, is, me is, is merely reduced to a ritual. The rise of very complicated legislation, which I think is not unrelated to state level bans on private legislation, um, has made parliamentary procedure within state legislative assemblies almost unmanageable. And two, we must look at the rise of technology, like the word processor and emails, our very understanding of the nature of how text is created and how decision making happens has been subverted by some of these uh, developments. Text, sometimes, I've been at meetings like this, arrives after the decisions on that text have been taken. Um, it's not any longer thought uh, proper to insist all the time on having a specific text before, you, before making a decision. And I don't know how familiar American audiences are with uh, Yes Minister, a great comedy from the 1980s, um, but there's this comment on minutes in that uh, satirical uh, series. The purpose of minutes is not to record events, says Sir Humphrey. It is to protect people. Minutes are there to reflect what people thought they should have said with the benefit of hindsight. Unfortunately, many people have taken this uh, not as satire. 
but as instruction. But I hope we will pay more attention to the previous 200 years because I think parliamentary law was for a long time and should still be one of the great pillars of democratic culture. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, uh, yeah, as you, as you know, decorum in Congress has been written about, and you know, de you know, decorum and that kind of is is not really what I was was talking about. Although you're right, you know, European observers uh, don't write very well about the U.S. Congress, particularly the House of Representatives. I think Tocqueville has some very amusing passages uh, on that. In terms of the procedure, the, the US authorities are constantly searching for ways in which they think American practice might have diverged from parliamentary practice. But they actually retain an amazing deference to what parliament is doing. And that, that's one of the things that's really surprised me surveying uh, the sort of authorities that are written in the 19th century, that they still have the, it, it, it is one of those truly transatlantic bits of law they are terribly concerned with what Parliament is doing and how parliamentary practice might be evolving because they see that that kind of evolution will influence America as well. I, I think a lot of authorities also really struggle um, to try and get a handle on the variety of practice at state level. So you, it's all very well to set out to write the Lex Parliamentaria Americana and say, I'm going to look at all, all of the state legislatures and look at their practice. but. Um, it's quite clear that that task is very, very difficult. And it's, it's actually much easier to write about developments in Parliament and contrast them with a few developments in American practice. And that tends to be what American authorities do. Um, it's, it's also interesting that, um, you know, the Senate manual is the thing that is most published. But because it's not the popular house, some American authorities think that it's the House of Representatives, which isn't publishing its rules and procedure in, in, in the same kind of way, should be the authority for running your local law society or, lo your lo you know, um, and yet that's very hard to get a handle on. So there's quite a lot of confusion about where authority lies in this area, even though authorities have to recognize that because parliamentary law is simply um, the sort of application of precedence in various bodies, it is constantly evolving. So there, there is that real tension in how people are, are thinking about it. Sir? I've been in a number of meetings in which the, the uh, procedure is so long and so complicated that at the end I'll agree to anything. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, I did labor that point at the convention because I think there is definitely a sunk cost um, there is a sunk cost uh, sort of, I was going to say fallacy, is that the right word? But, it, but it, there is a sense of sunk cost in a lot of these processes. And, and some of the work we've been doing has been looking at uh, non-constitutional texts. So we've got a project at the moment on um, some of the Good Friday processes uh, and, and some international bodies as well. And I think sometimes this momentum of the process does keep people there. And I think the Part of the, the, the magic of some of this, and I think this was definitely in operation at the federal convention, was that you're only asking people to agree to very small fragments of text at any one time. But that once you've done that and sat there for weeks, yes, of course, a few people are going to walk out. But this process seems to hold people together. Whereas if you really did just say on day one, look, you know, 
these are our positions. Should we take a vote on them? I think the, the process would have, would have broken up. So I, I think that idea of a, a process that is, um, I'll, I'll use your word, boring enough to, uh, to, to not seem that at any particular moment everything is on the line is part of the magic of this. this that was wonderful. Um, I, I guess I think we can all probably think of um, bits of modern legislation where the legislator will will sort of walk back and say, "Well, I didn't really read the entire bill." Um, and I guess I wanted to ask you about your sort of theory of collective authorship, um, which is the phrase that kept um, that kept coming up. And I love the idea of the. Constitution as a bundle, uh, as the result of 1,100 to 1,400 individual decisions. Because the first question would be, why can't we be more precise <laughs> about that? About that. But then, how do you square the the difference between those individual decisions, which are often highly structural, yes. um, with the sort of sense of the committee of detail or style? That is rendering these decisions then in a in a textual form, and then often printing them, yep. you know, with with the um, beautifully sort of flush right, so that there's lots and lots of room on the left for modification, and sort of as they go through the convention structure, you know, less and less <coughs> one room is left, so that they can get closer and closer to consensus the the, the closer they are. Yeah. So, so two, two really terrific questions there. So why, why, why can't I give you a more precise figure on decision? Part, partly because it, it slightly depends what you count. So um, we, we, know, we know that they voted on each of the rules individually, we, we, you know, for example. And, and we can infer that at various moments um, they were reading through clauses clause by clause, and we can sort of infer that they would have said, you know, yes to that and to that. But I don't want to sort of overclaim and give such a specific figure that somebody will say, well, you know, um, we, don't, we don't know for sure that that particular clause was definitely voted on separately to other things. So there, there's a tiny bit of interpretation left. Although, uh, I mean, the, the records have often been assumed to be so imperfect that when we set out to build a uh, so the, the platform that uh, the Quill Project runs is sort of word track changes on steroids for, for historians. Um, and, and I thought I would have to reconcile um, different wording in Madison and in Jackson and in other authorities. So I thought that there would be ambiguity about what the precise words that had been voted on was. So it took about three months to build a system to deal with um, different sources you know, suggesting that the text that had been voted on was different. And we never used it. Um, it you know, the Madison's records and Jackson's records um, sometimes capture different clauses being voted on, so they're not comprehensive. They sometimes disagree about the order in which things were voted on, because Jackson, I think, wrote up a fair copy, and, and Madison is obviously. But, but they never disagree meaningfully on the wording that was being voted on, um, which is an interesting null result, because I had expected something completely different. Um, what do I make of the Committee of Detail and the Committee of Staff? Well, they just sit at the middle of the process. So, and again, this was why I sort of labored, I think, the, 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 the actual process of debate, because the, the Committee of Detail's work is then debated again in incredible detail, even though you know, even though many of the sort of big points have already been debated, and then the Committee of Staff's work is debated in similar amounts of detail, um, clause by clause. So it's not the case that the, the committees are given instructions, they produce something that looks all right, and then there's a more or less up or down vote. There's a huge amount of detailed work at every stage in the process. So I, I think the sort of idea of collective audit authorship continues throughout the convention. Now, it is true that almost all um, processes that are producing text of any length do at one time or another defer to a very small committee to do the sort of major work of drafting. Um, so it's very hard to sit in a room and draft text completely from scratch. So mostly what large groups of people do is amend text that has been suggested by other groups. And, and this in the, in the sort of um, 
mid 19th century onwards becomes a process where you actually parcel out different bits of text, different subcommittees, um, and have them draft that. And then you have other committees sometimes to reconcile those bits. And then as a plenary session, you, you go through it. So that process gets, gets refined a bit. But, I, but I, I like this idea of collective authorship, because I think that's what's giving a lot of constitutional texts of moral authority or, or other resolutions moral authority. I think that answers those. You have to. Yeah. So. Thank you for a fascinating talk. What I've been puzzling over is could it be the case that constitutional conventions are entirely different from the activities of legislatures and we might expect a different process? It even might be good that ordinary legislatures don't follow this kind of process because it's inefficient. So I'm just wondering about that. Yeah, I, I mean, but I, I suppose legislative assemblies, if, if, if you ask legislative assemblies, how do you run your processes, they'll tell you they behave like this. It's just that, I mean, fr fr from the beginning of the Republic, there have been various attempts to just template legislation and get bills through. But I, I think you know, at state level, people who sort of watch state level um, uh, houses, uh, and indeed, the Federal Congress suggests that legislators are spending less and less time debating changes to more and more complicated texts, so that the texts that ultimately get passed have been written by, um, at best, technical staff, or at worst, uh, pressure groups coming along with, with language that's not given proper scrutiny. Um, I'm not sure that's a good thing uh, at all, I think, you know, because it, because it it sort of undercuts, um, uh, it undercuts the sort of authority of the text. I, I love that moment in the oral arguments uh, about the uh, Health Care Act, the Obama Health Care Act, where the Supreme Court said, well, you don't, you don't expect us to have read this bill. Do you? And, uh, and I, I, I wonder if the only people who had actually read it all the way through from start to finish had been the speed readers on the floor of Congress who'd been tasked with reading out the whole text. Um, so I do think there are problems for modern legislative assemblies that they ought to grapple with. Procedures always invite like strategic behavior. I mean, if you yeah. view it as collective, then you sort of, in a way, um, um, obfuscate the individuals who are spying for different positions and different, uh, different positions here. So can you think in your study at the American State Constitution or anything like this, any instances in which these procedures were strategic? There are, there are some state conventions where um, people will object to um, motions being put on the grounds that they're out of order. So, and, and you might expect that to happen quite a lot of the time. And, and in some state conventions, there's clearly somebody with a copy of Robert's Rules or Cushing, you know, sitting in a corner, thumbing through, because you know, the, 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 um, the, the record actually refers to, you know, some figures as being particularly expert in it. So occasionally people do try and manipulate the process. But in general, what's striking is the, the sort of school textbooks and the authorities on parliamentary law might lead you to think that there would be constant arguments about rules and which motions take precedence and, and that sort of thing. But in actual, in actual operation, um, most of the time, um, people have been quite uh, congenial. The process is quite flexible. In building the computer model, we never build in the actual rules of debate, because if we did, we'd be flagging up all the time that a motion was probably out of order or whatever. And that's not really the point. That's not really. So occasionally that happens. Now, there is a selection bias here. So I've mostly looked at successful conventions. And there are a lot of failed conventions. And a project at some point, although you know, getting people enthused about failed conventions is a, is a whole <laughs> task. But, but I'd like to know what happens where this process doesn't work. And I suspect, my hypothesis it will be, that there is then a lot more argument about process um, in those conventions because it, it's an obvious vulnerability. Well, thank you for an illuminating and insightful lecture. Please join me in thanking our 2023 uh, fourth lecturer, Dr. Nicholas Gall. Thank you.